So in triple integrals, we're describing regions that are three dimensions. So the difference in terms of the wording is we're going to be describing, so there were three dimensional regions. And instead of writing regions bounded by, we're going to write regions enclosed by. So we're just changing that middle word. <laughs> So we'll use REB for region and close by. And this means that our region will be three dimensions. <clears throat> there'll be something really obvious when you're in three dimensions, which is a third coordinate. So there'll be Zs, Xs, Ys, and Zs. So that's another indication you're in three dimensions. Whereas before in two dimensions, we only had Xs and Ys when we were doing regions uh, bounded by. <clears throat> So I'm going to briefly go back to two dimensions. So this will be back in the good old days, two dimensions. Some questions I gave you were the region bounded above by this and below by this, or inside this, outside that. I'm telling you a side of the curve to be on. So here's an example where I'm going to draw two finite curves, meaning two curves that don't go on forever, I have to tell you specifically inside which circle or outside which circle, or maybe I'm inside both circles. Depending on what I say, maybe we're inside one, outside the other, so we get the crescent shape. Maybe I want to be inside both, so we get the football. Maybe we want the other crescent, so you have to know if we're inside or outside, or above or below. That's for finite, uh, when your curves have a finite length. Uh, let's look at now infinite curves. So the easiest one I could think of, well, there's a straight line and parabola are probably some of the easiest infinite curves I can draw. So let's do one of each. Now I could ask you for what's the area of the region enclosed by these curves. I don't have to tell you above or below, inside or outside. Why is that? Let's count up the number of regions this divides the plane into. So there's an upper left an upper middle, an upper right. Now technically the entire bottom is all one region right here. And then there's one more region. So if I, I could draw another four here, but everything below all this is the fourth region. Why is region five the only one I would ever ask you about? What do all the other regions have in common? Infinite area. So that's an issue that happens if your curves are infinite in length there's going to be partitions or regions that are infinitely large. And we're going to use the one that's not infinitely large. Now, when we shift into three dimensions, it gets a little more tricky. So I wanted to draw things in two dimensions so that it makes a little bit more sense and it's easy to see. Now we're about to shift over in three dimensions. So sometimes I'll tell you above or below if that's important. Other times we'll just describe things as between or the, re the region enclosed by. And that's our first example that we're going to look at is just region enclosed by. I should just tell you before we get started, we're going to have now we're subdividing three dimensional space into little boxes. So before we cut it into squares, because we had a two-dimensional space, now we're cutting it into three-dimensional boxes because we have a three-dimensional space. So before it was dx, dy, so that was the width and the height. Now we also have a depth or a third dimension, which will be dz. <coughs> and the volume of this cube right here is dx, dy, dz. You can multiply them any order you want. There are six orders I could write out. dx, dz, dy, dy, dx, dz, dy, dz, dx, dz, dx, dy, dz, dy, dx. 
these are all the same dv. When we're actually integrating, we're going to have a triple integral over a region d. What does changing the dv part actually affect in our integral? So it's going to change our endpoints around. So it's going to change the order, which unless you're actually integrating over a proper rectangular box, is not just swapping the numbers. So we saw that before, even something simple as a triangle, if you swap numbers, or swap a dx, dy, you're going to have to do a little bit of algebra and re, uh, basically resolve for your intersections. Uh, so making any of these swaps is going to change endpoints. Or I should say end curves, because not all our points, sometimes we have a curve. So ready for our first example? D is the region enclosed by, so again, the instead of RBB, this is REB. So region enclosed by Z equals X squared plus 3Y squared and z equals 8 minus x squared minus y squared. This is all the information we have. So again, it doesn't in here tell us above one or below one. The reason why I'm using the words above and below, we have our z-axis, x and y. When I say above, because they're both solved for z, so they're both z as a function of x and y. So I can think about if we're above <coughs> one of these or below. All right, graphing is going to be pretty useless, so we're not going to do it. You can look in your textbook. This is the first example in 15.5. You can see the graph I showed you earlier, but we're not really going to use that here. How do we intersect curves or intersect equations? So basically we want to eliminate a variable and in this case they're both solved for z so I don't have to solve any of them for z they're already solved we're going to take one version of z and plug it in for the other z so we don't have to do that step where we solve for a variable and then substitute it in we're just going right and subbing in the z expression for the other z So I'm just going to write the instructions, solve for one variable. Here we're going to use z. And plug into the other equation for that variable. So I'm going to write the second equation down. We're going to sub out that z, and we're going to put in the other expression for z. So once we have this, let's use some algebra to make this look nicer. We'll add x squared to both sides, 2x squared. Add y squared plus 4y squared equals 8. So I can factor a 2 out of everywhere and then multiply by half. So it's x squared plus 2y squared equals 4. Now 4 is also known as 2 squared. I'm going to do one more algebra step. What will the graph of this curve almost look like? If you don't know exactly what it's going to look like, what is it going to almost be? So it's going to be almost a circle with a radius 2. What is this square root 2 times a y going to do to our graph? So either shift or stretch? 
So it's going to stretch. So let's graph it out. We're going to use a clueless method, but we're not totally clueless because we know it's going to look somewhat circular. So let's be smart about what points to plot. So let's plot the x-axis intercepts and the y-axis intercepts. So plot those out now. So to get my x-intercept, I'm going to set y equal to 0 and then figure out the x-coordinates. Plot those and then set x equal to 0, find the y-coordinates. So do that right now. So my x-intercepts are plus or minus 2. So we get y is plus or minus the square root of 2, which is close to 1.4. So we'll just write it between 1 and 2, and negative 1 and negative 2. So there's our four points. Any questions on those intercepts? So this should be enough with our intuition that it looks cir circular-ish. So draw your ellipse. You're basically just making a stretch or circle with these four points. When you look in the book, this is that almost circular shadow that you see underneath that, uh, underneath that region that we were looking at. So that's what we just did right here. Now I do have to determine which z, val which z equation is going to be the upper and which is the lower so that I put them in the right place. What would be the consequence? Well, let's write all this out. So our Volume is going to be the triple integral d of 1 dv. So when you're finding volume, you use a 1 to find volume. We did this before with area, where we integrate a 1 to get the area. So we're just going up a dimension. So you're integrating one to get the next higher dimensional measurement, which is volume. So the first function in there is calculating the whole dimension. A better way to think about it, rather than your a fourth dimension, is this is a uh, constant density. I think would be a better physics way to interpret this. Your density is one, a uniform density all over, and you could be saying this is the weight. I think at that point, you'd be adding up all the density getting a weight if you wanted a more physics intuition of what we're doing. Uh, and when this is not one, when it's a, f or not, anytime it's not a constant, then your density varies as you're going across your object. Does that, does that make some sense? Okay. So we're using one to say like every cubic centimeter is one gram or something like that. We want the total weight, which would be exactly in proportion with the total volume. Or fourth dimension, whatever works. doesn't matter. All right, so I need to know upper and lower, <clears throat> but let's go ahead and just write out as much as we can. So if I tried to draw in the z-axis, I could make an attempt to think about it coming out of the paper. There's basically some type of blobby region. It's three-dimensional, so I'm doing a really bad job drawing a three-dimensional blob here, and we're looking at the shadow. 
This idea of looking at the shadow or projecting is how you want to think about this. Yeah, it's a cloud that works. So you're thinking about the shadow as it hits the flat earth. The earth's always flat in physics and math. Uh, it's not flat in real life, but we're not in real life right now. All right. So I'm going to pick my DZ first. The reason is I see the two bounds right here. I don't know which is the upper and I don't know which is the lower, but they're already solved for Z, which is the only reason that I'm putting DZ first. I already have Z as a function of X and Y. So that's my motivation. So DZ first. because we're given z as a function of x and y. If I was given y as a function of x and z, I would be doing dy first. So I have two z functions. I don't know which one's top and which one's bottom yet. What would be the consequence of getting it wrong, of putting the bottom where the top should be? Negative. I would get negative. So it's not the worst consequence in the world. If you get negative, chances are you made this mistake of swapping your two, uh, your two functions. So what if you just don't get it and take the value? You could also just get the area and then take the absolute value at the end. Uh, now if I switch two of them, I would negative, negative, I would get the correct volume computed in a slightly incorrect way. All right, how do I figure out which function's on top and which is on bottom? How did we figure that out before? I know where they're equal. They're equal on this ellipse. Now, first of all, I didn't say if we're inside or outside. Is our region going to be inside or outside? outside. Better be inside, because if it's outside, you're going to have infinity or negative infinity. So we're definitely inside. So how can I figure out in this domain here which z function is greater, which z function is less. If I plot any point, if I figure out the value of any point here, I should get the same z value because that's how we computed it. So all I have to do is take a point inside and decide which z value is higher on the first function or second function. What's the easiest point inside this ellipse? Zero, zero. So we're picking any point inside. I'm picking the easy one. And we're going to decide which is the big, which is the little. So we're plugging in an interior point. So to decide which z function is above, which means, in this case, greater. So my first equation, z equals x squared plus 3y squared. So that's going to be 0 plus 0 equals 0. So our first equation gives 0. Now our second equation, 8 minus x squared minus y squared. 8 minus 0 minus 0. So our second equation is actually the big, and our first equation is the small. So we're ready to use that information right here. So we have our big. I'll keep the blue marker here so it's consistent. So our big one is the 8 minus x squared minus y squared, and the little is x squared plus 3y squared. So any questions on what we did here? Now I can choose, do I go dz dx dy or dz dy dx? It doesn't matter at this point because if we look over here, somewhere we wrote down 
This is the equation representing the x and y bounds. I can solve for x, I can solve for y. Which variable is easiest to solve for? I say probably x, a little bit less messy. So let's go ahead and solve for x here. I better switch colors again. So we'll solve for x. x equals 4 minus 2y squared square root with a plus and a minus. Now we're going to label this on the graph. I have a plus and a minus, so this ellipse is neither a function of x nor a function of y. I'm trying to write it as a function of y, but I can't because there are, for any given y value, there's two x values. Well, at least for most y values, there's two x values. So the left curve is a left curve, it's the left half right here. Is that the plus or the minus? Are the x coordinates negative on the left or positive on the left? Negative. negative. So it's the negative square root because x is negative, less than zero. So we have negative square root, four minus two y squared. That means the right side, so this is the entire left side uses that. Now the right side, we have a different bound. I'll go to green for that. The right side, similar, it's x equals positive square root four minus two y squared. So from here, x is a function of y. That means dx is my next uh, derivative. So I'll keep this in that yellow-orange color. So we have dx. Which one is the big x? Is it the one on the right or the one on the left? So when the one's positive and one's negative, it should be pretty clear without just knowing numbers. The positive one's the big one, but you always want to look on the right side when you're on your x-axis, or tilt your head so up is increasing. So our positive square root is the top, and our negative square root is the bottom. You may want to space your integral notation out a little more. I'm kind of running out of room. You really don't want your bound to run into your next bound. It's already confusing enough. I'm using multiple colors, so it's a little less bad up here. So I talked about thinking about a shadow. So we just took care of the x bounds. Last up, we'll go with red. So we're going to do dy next. So I need a y and a y. These need to be numbers. You always have to get numbers on your outside. Your outermost bounds can't depend on anything. They have to be constants. So let's think about what we did before. So before, we took three dimensions and turned them into two dimensions. So we eliminated our z. Not a coincidence that that was the first variable we integrated. We eliminated z. Next up, we eliminate x. So I want to know, what does my region look like to y's? So I want to look at my region, think about the y-axis now. And the way you can think about this is, it's a little weird to think of the shadow cast on the y-axis, because you'd have to have a light source on both sides, because it's in the y-axis. But you can think about compressing it like a garbage compactor compresses it down to the y-axis. That's called a projection. So you're basically smashing this whole graph to the y-axis. What would, what y-values would be used? It's everything from our largest y-value down to the smallest y-value. And again, visually, you can just think of taking this ellipse and compacting it down to a line segment. And we wrote those values down, but I didn't write them on the graph. They were both square root two 
and negative square root two. Those were the two y values we computed. So that's your min and your max. So you're systematically going one coordinate at a time and then eliminating that coordinate. <clears throat> so how do you integrate this? We have a nice colorful integral here. When we're actually doing calculus, we haven't really done any integration yet, just set up. Now there's two sets of parentheses. So if we parenthesize, it looks like this. So we're going to deal with the inside integral first, the z integral, then the x integral, and then the y integral. So I think this is going to take too long, and it's not terribly hard to do. You've done the two dimensional integrals. So this is just a third dimension. There's a lot to keep track of, but as long as you go slowly, and this example is fully worked out in the book. I really want to focus on setting them up as opposed to integrating them, because I think that's the really hard part, is setting them up. So in the interest of practicing the setup, I want you to reorder this integral. Don't reorder the z's, because if you move dz out, you're going to have to solve for x or y, and you're going to get a plus minus, and you're going to have a different upper and lower function depending on what part of the region you're in. It's going to be miserable. So set the integral up again with the same z bounds. But this time, go dy dx. So find the four endpoints if I reverse the dx dy order into dy dx. So I want numbers for x and functions of, so your y should be a function of x. And your other y will be some other, I'll go with g of x. So I need two x functions for the middle bounds and then numbers for the outer bounds. So the outer bounds, the x bounds, are just the x values, negative 2 to 2. The inner bounds, the y's, you have to solve for y, so it's going to look really similar. You're just going to get that plus minus square root. And again, positive on top, negative on the bottom. If you get the same exact thing, your negative's on the bottom, positive's on the top. So ready for our next example? Do not be afraid to start your problem on a new page at this point in calculus class. You may not even want to try to squeeze two problems on a page at some point. So 
So this is problem number three. That first example we did was the example right from the book that is all worked out. This one is not worked out. volume of a tetrahedron cut from the first octant by the plane 6x plus 3y plus 2z equals 6. All right, so there's a new word here, octant. Now, the word octant, there's two parts, oct and ant. So where have you seen a word that ends in ant describing some type of region? So we've seen quadrant. Uh, 2z. So quadrant. Well, it's got an extra R in the middle, so it sounds nice. But quad means four, ant, I don't really know what that means, but a way to partition <laughs> things into four. All right, so octant is a way to partition into eight. So what are we partitioning? Well, right away I can see we're in three dimensions. So let's think about our coordinate axes and how, what would be a natural way to cut that into eight pieces? So each axis could be the normal of a plane. So if you think of three planes, so the z axis is the normal of the x, z, uh, the x, y plane. And there's one plane this direction, one going kind of vertical, and then another one vertical out of the board, and then vertical parallel with the board. So I don't want to try to draw all those. Here's a good way to draw the first octant. Just draw your regular axes, but be, be very careful of where they intersect and delete all their negative parts. So if I carefully go in like that, now I've basically drawn the first octant. Now it's the first octant because all coordinates are positive. Don't ask me where the second octant is because you're gonna to have to make one of the coordinates negative. What would the fifth be when they're all negative? Depending on the order, you have to choose some order. Hopefully it's some natural-ish type of order. Uh, but it is a choice. If it's not decided. It's decided by somebody who's not me, probably. And I don't know, there may be disagreement. I've never seen the second octant referred to. So I don't know which coordinate you'd make negative. I'd say x just because it's first, but who knows. All right, but first octant we all agree is where all coordinates are positive. How in the world can I graph a plane or, or any shape where I don't know what it's going to look like? Clueless method. How many points do you need to graph a plane? Three points. What are the three easiest points to graph I'd say the intercepts of the plane with the axis. So let's do the x-axis intercept first. What do I set equal to zero to be on the x-axis? What coordinates are zero when I'm on the x-axis? Y and Z. It's the other two coordinates. So y is 0, z is 0, 6, x equals 6, x equals 1. So that would be the point 1, 0, 0. All right, find the other two intercepts right now. Find the y and the z.
So you got one for x, two for y, three for z. And you can draw. Luckily, you can draw a, this would be a triangle very easily because straight lines appear as straight lines. Curves, different story. But no matter what angle you look at a line from, it looks like a straight line. Curves, depending on where you look from, a parabola could look like a line if you are looking at it at the right angle. So curves have serious problems when it comes to being drawn. Lines, not so much. All right, so we have our shape drawn right here. We're in the first octant. So what we're going to do, I need an upper and a lower function if I use my z-coordinate. We just did dz first in our last problem, our previous problem. Let's not do dz first. Let's go with... Let's do dy first. So I'm leaving plenty of space with my integrals here. I want to get the volume, and I want dy first. So let's think about, in the y-axis, what is the little function of y? Zero. Zero. So I'm looking at the left bound of this. The minimum y value is always zero. This y bound is pretty nice because this plane happens to be exactly uh, parallel with the, or perpendicular to the y axis. So this y equals zero is the lower bound. All right, the upper bound. The upper bound is not constant. So it's the plane that we drew but we need to write it as y as a function of x and z. So our big function will be y equals 2 minus 2x minus 2 thirds z. So any questions about our upper function here? OK, so we took care of the y-axis. So what we need to do now is think about the y-axis compacted down to nothing. So we're going to put this tetrahedron in the garbage compactor, and the y-axis is going to turn into nothing. What shape are we going to be left with once our y-axis is compacted down? We're going to have a nice triangle. So I'm going to erase things for a second. Don't do this on your paper. We're going to redraw this. But just to clear out what we're looking at, if I throw out the y-axis, this is what we're looking at. We'll draw it in a nicer way, but I just want you to see exactly what it looks like in this uh, perspective. So we're going to redraw that down here. So I have an x-axis and I have a z-axis. My x-intercept is 1, my z-intercept is 3. Now, if you're wondering how does this relate to the upper picture, you are looking, that's not a very good eye. I'm trying to draw an eyeball. So it's supposed to be a face with some eyes, but you're looking from the left side <laughs> to the right. <laughs> it's the worst face I've drawn in a while. There you go. So you're looking on that side right there. You can either, uh, well, first of all, we need to figure out what is this 
line right here. So use your middle school skills and write the equation of this line. You got a z-intercept and a slope. Well, you should be able to tell what the slope is. It's negative. So I would use z equals mx plus b. The only difference is z, y is out, z is in. So we have z equals negative 3x plus 3. How can I test? Maybe I forgot lines. I forgot everything about slopes and intercepts. How can I check if this is correct? Plug in the two points. I have a linear equation, and if I have two points that match, it's the right line. So I have 0, 3, 1, 0. Plugging these in, when x is 0, uh, z is 3. That's correct. And when x is 1, 1 times negative 3 is negative 3, plus 3 is 0. So my two points work. All right, we're good to go. Right now, it would make sense to use dz as my next integration variable because I have a function z as a function of x. So I'm basically just making the convenient choice because I don't want to work harder than I need to. Well, if I assume in this case, you'll get lucky because when y is 0, this triangle coincidentally the intersection of this region with the xz plane is coincidentally the same thing as compacting it down. But that's a coincidence. So in general, you're not setting y equal to 0. You need to think about compacting that y-axis down. Uh, say your question again. So, like, in this case, it contains x of origin, but if we just, like, completely crossed out the axis that we're, like, that we're getting rid of, and then graph the theoretical version. If your graph is, the problem is this shape right here was two things at the same time. It was both the projection, when you project the y-axis out, and it's the intersection of this region with the xz plane. That usually won't happen. So for example, if our region, instead of, it kind of got smaller, it was, this is the base and the rest was smaller, but if it got bigger instead, uh, if the bottom base looked more like that, when I compacted it down, I would pick up a bunch of extra stuff over here. So if this was my shape, a kind of weird diamond type shape, when I compacted it down, I would actually get this triangle over here when I compacted it down, but which would not be the same as my original intersection. It's, it's facing from x and z, it's the y axis. So if we just cross that part out entirely, we can just compact down whatever is left. Um, I don't know what you're talking about, but if this was our situation, this whole part is missing right here on the y axis, on the x axis, so there'd be all this missing part right here when I compacted it down. Maybe on the last one, if we didn't solve for z, then we solve for like y or something. You can't solve for y in the last problem. You can't solve for x on the last problem because they're both squared terms. So you'd have a plus or minus issue. All 
All right, so let's go back to the breakdown that we have here. Is this our big Z or our little Z? It's the big because it's in the positive Z axis. So in this case, it would be above. What is the little Z? Zero. Z equals zero. <clears throat> and we're ready for the outer bounds. So again, let's keep this idea of compacting down an axis. So we just knocked out the Z axis. So compact the Z axis out. So here was our old shape. If we eliminate the Z axis and compact it down, this luckily, this time around, it's the same as the original intersection right here. But again, we got lucky this time around. So we're going to go from 0 to 1 in our Xs. Now on this problem, I could have gone any coordinate first that I wanted. Because I was given the plane, it's equally easy to solve for x, y, or z. I only decided to solve for y because the first one we had solved for z. I could have just easily solved for z or x, and I would have had dz or dx as my original, my inside integration uh, variable. So I think we'll do one more problem tomorrow. And that will be the end.